Okay, today we've got a little video on the Neolithic Revolution and River Valley Civilizations. And, and really what I want to do is talk about what is the Neolithic Revolution, what does it look like? And then we'll transition and we'll talk about four different River Valley Civilizations. So we'll talk about Egypt, which I'm betting you know a lot about. We'll transition and we'll talk about Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. We'll also talk about the mysterious ancient Indus River Valley people of India. And then lastly, we'll talk about China. And to understand why China develops the way it does, I think you should know about their first dynasty. It will help to shape your understanding of the people of China. This lecture is designed to give you an introduction and a little window into social studies as a discipline. Remember, we're not just talking about history necessarily. I want you to understand how we understand and learn about some of these early, early civilizations. So let's begin uh, with some basic vocab. We'll talk you through the Neolithic Revolution and we'll get you on out of here. So the first thing, um, when we don't have a written record, we call that prehistory, okay, when there's nothing written down. And to understand a people's culture, you know, their way of life, in other words, often we have to rely on primary sources, things that the people left behind. Now, sometimes there's a written record and, and we're able to discern that these people wrote um, in, in, in this particular time period and we can glean a lot of information from a primary source. It's from the time period. It's written in that sort of way. So for example, if we were studying the uh, Holocaust, for example, and we had a, a journal, a diary written by Anne Frank, right? that would be a primary source. She wrote it at the time we're studying it at a later time. But if we're studying that same time period and we have a historian that's trying to analyze um, Adolf Hitler's decisions before that, then we would consider that a secondary source, right? If we're writing after the time and we're trying to analyze, that would be a secondary source. It's coming after that time. So a primary source could be like a letter from a Civil War soldier, um, but a secondary source is more a historian writing about the time period later. Okay, And we use these sources to understand the people's culture. Sometimes people don't leave behind written records because this is prehistory, right? And so you have to study artifacts, and I'll have a little definition for you down the, down the road on that. But archaeology is the study of those artifacts. So if you're looking at like broken arrowheads or you're looking at bones and trying to use what we call carbon dating uh, to understand how, how old certain bones are, that's, that's archaeology. You're looking at what people left behind. And hopefully uh, analyzing those things and saying, okay, well, if they had arrowheads, they must have hunted, right? Um, if they have... Um, seeds they must have farmed, right? If you're, you're looking at what they left behind. Um, anthropology, and you'll, you'll get this in my classes, the study of cultures, okay? And, and I try to make the point that cultures can seem very weird from the outside perspective, right? But every culture could sound really, really weird from an outside perspective. Uh, if you take yourself away from the culture, if you, you step back and you, you, you try to look at it, not from an American perspective, but just from, from an outsider's perspective, our culture probably seems pretty weird. And we've done some exercises to, to help you understand that, so, uh, so I'll keep moving. Um, some of this stuff is a little scientific. Uh, we talk about hominids and uh, homo sapiens. And honestly, um, in your textbook, it is homo sapiens sapiens, right? Wise, wise humans. But I don't want to spend too much time on that just for you to understand that scientists have decided and came up with a theory based on evidence that they believe that the first people came from Africa. Uh, this is the, the wide theory that scientists believe in. And I'll talk about it a little bit later, but you know, whether you believe in the, the biblical interpretation or whether you believe in the scientific or somewhere in between, it doesn't matter to me what you believe in necessarily. It matters to me more that you're able to recognize that, that there are two, two sort of competing perspectives here, right? The biblical one, which we will spend a whole unit on, and um, the more scientific one. And I, I want you to just be able to accept that there are multiple perspectives on this, okay? Um, I don't want you to shut yourself down, and I'm also not telling you to believe one side or the other. 
Um, that's for you and your family to decide. Okay. Uh, if you see um, BC and AD, uh, BC before Christ, AD after um, Christ, and we'll talk about Jesus Christ and, and really give you a good story to, to help you understand that. But, but that's where we sort of in the West chronalize um, history. Now, um, we're going to study geography. I think you, you understand what geography is on a basic level. We'll really spend more time uh, addressing how geography impacts people. And I guess that's the, the root of this lecture and the root of this idea that people did not choose river valleys because, um, hey, I really like to get splashed with water. It, it was a, a choice because it was advantageous. It allowed them to grow. It allowed them to have more food. And as a result, with more food comes more people. More people become strength. Uh, and you can have an army. And you can have a, a leadership position. That's a, a very materialist argument. We'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. I want you to know the difference between latitude, the ladder of latitude, right? You're climbing up the ladder of latitude. Um, they help to measure north and south. But the lines, they run east they run west, okay? Uh, so an example of latitude would be the equator, right? And something to understand about latitude is the closer you are to the equator, the warmer you are. That's why if you think about it, uh, New York, we have our seasons, but if you get closer to Florida, right, it gets to be a lot hotter and they have very, very mild winters, okay? They're closer to the equator. So latitude and the equator, try to get those two things in your brain. Whereas longitude, um, runs north and south and they're going to help you measure distances going east and west if you were you know, navigating a ship of some sort right and so an example of a longitude line would be the prime meridian runs north and south zero degrees right in the center of the of the world okay so that's a little bit of okay now the way that i will be teaching you is through two lenses and they're competing lenses right and, and not to say that you can't believe a little bit of one and a little bit of other, of another but typically historians uh, will see history through one of two lenses and it really guides their interpretation and i'm betting that you have a a way that you feel or lean towards i'm hoping to challenge that as we go forward uh, the first school of history i call it materialism and materialism says that history is driven by our need to get stuff, okay? And what do I mean by stuff? I'm talking about uh, money. I'm talking about proximity to mountains. Are you close to mountains and therefore that protects you and therefore you don't have to um, spend so much time fighting with other people and so you can develop better technology, okay? Um, is history driven by the need for money? Is the reason why people attack other people because they want to get natural resources, because they want to sell those natural resources to make a lot of gold um, and become rich? Is that why uh, history is driven through that? Is history driven by technology? I have um, better spears that don't break when I throw them at people, and so I am able to take over others. Um, is it driven by population? I have more people, therefore I can be more successful in creating a larger army. Materialism is about tangible things that you can touch, that you can feel, right? Idealism is something a little bit more tricky. It says that history is driven more by the people and their ideas. What, what a person's idea is. And so it's a little bit harder to defend. But when you look at idealism, you're driven by uh, the concept of religion, right? That, that the Crusades were fought by uh, people who believed in God and people who believed that their God should have the Holy Land, right? This is something that you can't really touch. It's something that you can't really uh, necessarily you know, feel with your hands, maybe, but, but it's an idea, right? We'll talk about nationalism at some later date, especially in 10th grade. You know, do you love your nation so much? Are you so patriotic that you're willing to um, fight for your nation and even die for your nation? You know, that's something that you can't really uh, you know, touch, but it certainly um, has mobilized people in the past. Is it about leadership? Is, is history about the greatest leaders? You know, Julius Caesar and Hannibal of Carthage, right? And their strategies that they use. Is that the most important idea? So when we talk about idealism, we're talking about individual people and what they believe, right? And can they mobilize um, a group of people? So idealism driven by ideas. 
Okay, pretty easy to remember. And materialism driven by the need for stuff. Okay, and so um, while I while I ask students about this, and, and often they'll blend the two and they'll say, well, it's this and this. I, I want you to try to challenge yourself to say which one is more important. Right? Can you argue? Can you defend what you what your claim is? That's really really important to me, and we will practice that throughout the year. Okay, so two schools. All right, so we start. Um, with the out of Africa theory, the idea that 130,000 years ago people had migrated across and and moved um, all over the world, really, uh, crossing what we call Beringia, this this area over by Alaska uh, that connected Asia and in North America, and so scientists argue that, that Africa is where things started. And they, they believe that because that is where the oldest artifacts are coming from, right? So they have found some bones that are dating back to 130,000 years ago, and they're, they haven't found that kind of age uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, they believe that Homo sapiens of Africa met with Neanderthals of Europe, and the Neanderthals uh, were essentially wiped out. Uh, possibly by conflict is what, what scientists believe. And so, because of that, they argue that all people come from one subgroup, one group of people, Homo sapiens. We all come from the same thing. And ultimately, uh, the argument is we're all humans, right? We all come from the same ancestor. Therefore, uh, there's some commonality between us all. Um, okay. Now, dates are not Super, super important. I put them here just to sort of guide you um, as you're going through. I think that it's helpful to have some sort of framework, but I'm never going to ask you uh, to tell me where, when the Paleolithic Age was, the Old Stone Age. I'm not going to do that. Um, but to sort of talk about early humans, I want you to know that they were nomadic. They moved from place to place. The word is nomadic. Okay, nomadic people do not stay in the same place. They often follow herds. They have simple tools to hunt, you know, bow and arrow, spears, right? And they chase their prey, okay? They typically do not settle down for very long. It's often this quick moving, this constant moving people. So that's the Paleolithic age. Uh, not always, okay, especially in Africa, uh, but men often take that leadership role in hunting, and then women, uh, they run the village. And often in, in Africa, they have these what we call matrilineal societies where women take the major role and leadership role because they are in the village or they are at the home or they are um, uh, raising the children. And so you get this sort of split. It's, it's not a clean split. Sometimes women are hunting too. And, and so it's, it's certainly not a perfect split in roles. Um, but here's the key. In a nomadic society, Men and women have to work together very closely uh, to to achieve, you know, life really to stay stay alive. And so there really isn't much of a hierarchy when we talk about um, men versus women in the nomadic societies. Often they are more equal, men and women on a similar uh, status, similar level. Okay, that is a complicated idea, but think about it for a little while. Um, I took a um, picture online of, of Lascaux, which is a cave in France. Uh, I didn't get to go when I when I went to France. However, it's this painting, and and the paintings are paintings of animals. And I bring this up because it shows that people, when they um, when they were were around during the Paleolithic age, they wanted to capture uh, what they were seeing. They wanted to, in some ways, you know, capture the beauty of, of what was around them. And, and I think we still do that to this day. We just you know, don't do it with, with our painting necessarily. We'll do it with our smartphones. But there's some, there's some sort of commonality there of, of people uh, starting to, to want to capture the beauty that was around them. Um, I argue with my students that the defining discovery of mankind is really the, the discovery of fire. And fire uh, became an important survival technique because of the Ice Age, where things really, really cooled down. Um, I've got your dates there, but the point is, is that it got colder. And because it got colder, we needed to try to stay warm, right? Um, now, fire helped us 
to stay warm, but fire also gave us other things. You know, you could cook meat, you could defend against um, wild animals. You know, you got a wolf in front of you, you can put out your fire to scare that wolf. You could also make stronger tools. If you ever heard of like fire hardening um, spears, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so this gives us a huge, huge advantage of when we're trying to go against other animals. We have fire, and fire is a is a defining discovery for us. And just to sort of add on to the to the theory of the out of Africa theory is that um, once the ice age was over uh, and the sea levels went down. We see these land bridges develop and people start to be able to migrate and move because remember we're in nomadic times so people are always moving going from place to place following these mammoths uh, following these huge creatures uh, and as a result we get some movement we get some migration now if you were a discerning student if you're really thinking about this you know how do we know about all of this you know thousands thousands and thousands of years ago sometimes even millions of years ago how do we do that we call it carbon dating basically what you do is you take old old bones old fossils and you use carbon um, as a as an agent to figure out um, how old something is because carbon on bones carbon on fossils um, it decomposes at a certain rate and scientists have it down to a specific science and, and I guess you can ask uh, your biology teacher uh, about that but the point is is that by using carbon dating we are able to figure out how old things are in a, in a pretty reliable way and so uh, using carbon dating and then having archaeologists come in there and look at the different things that people left behind we can start to make claims so and, and I've talked about this, right? But the idea that you have these different clay pots, you can start to think about, okay, are they ornate? Like, are, do they have little carvings and drawings? They have a bunch of different drawings. Maybe maybe they have, you know, their, their gods are on there. Or maybe their animals are on there. And, and you really start to take a look at what these people had access to to sort of think about what they might have been doing with these artifacts. And then, by extension, you can start to make claims, okay, because they have all of these spears, they must have been on warlike people or or maybe because they have, you know, 10,000 spears, they had an army, right? And so you start to look at these things and you start to make general claims. Um, are they always right? No. Sometimes they're wrong. Um, but oftentimes they're able to make some pretty general claims that that's not, that's not pretty good. Okay. Um, I've talked about this as my disclaimer. Remember, um, I'm just trying to teach you. I am not trying to brainwash you. This is just what scientists have put out, and I think that you should be aware of it for sure and understand where other people are coming from. Um, if you have a different interpretation based on your own beliefs, um, again, that is for you and your parents to talk about. Okay, now, the first revolution. So how do we get from nomadic uh, to, I don't know, I guess today, right? And the first revolution in history that we, we talk about is the Neolithic Revolution. And I'll have to remind you about it in June, um, but the Neolithic Revolution is really the, the start. The start of civilization. And I call it the switch from hunting and gathering to farming. So no longer are we nomadic, chasing food, um, always constantly out there collecting berries and things. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to start using seeds to farm. And I have the series man kind of story of us. Essentially, this, this story started with a with an accident, and after this accident, where things started to grow, uh, food started to grow, people started to say, "Okay, we can we can use the soil to, to, to farm," and, and people through their ingenuity started to create fields um, of produce where people could start to eat and people could start to, if everybody can eat, we can stay in the same area. We don't have to constantly move. And if we don't have to constantly move and we can feed people, um, we have a little bit more time, a little more downtime. There can be farmers, um, but there are, can also be warriors to protect our village. And, and we'll start to see what we call a traditional economy. That is um, a farming economy. And I guess a key vocab word that I didn't put in there, but something you should know is, is what we call surplus. You grow so much food that you have more food than you actually need. And so you can store that food. And you can store that food for the winter. Because hunting in the winter is pretty tough. 
okay? So you store aside in your greenhouses enough food so that you can eat through the winter. And that's a pretty cool concept, right? Now you're not having to go out into the, into the mountains to search for, for wild elk or something like that, okay? Uh, people's lives are literally changed. We don't have that movement. So now you're going to see the wall gates. You're going to see settlements. You're going to see housing. And we'll talk about some of the effects. So uh, one thing you can start to do is what we call domesticate. And domesticate really means uh, that you're going to use animals to your benefit. They're not going to be, you know, you're, you're going to use your um, early dog, right? Your kind of wolf to protect your flock of sheep that you have domesticated so that you can use their wool and eventually use them for meat perhaps, okay? Um, humans, and this isn't an accident, you know, four big river valley civilizations that we're going to talk about, it's not an accident that they chose river valleys. They choose them because water is easily available. Why is water important? Well, water is essential for farming, isn't it? You need water to be able to grow your vegetables. And so people start to find ways to use the water, use the natural resources available to them to maximize their food production, to make as much food as they possibly can. And they're just using what they have, okay? And as food production is start, starts to increase, you can have people who specialize in farming, right? Farmers. But you can also have people that specialize um, in making things, right? So you have a blacksmith whose specialty is making weaponry, okay? And you're making that weaponry for the army that is used to protect you, okay? And somebody has to make sure that everyone is doing their job. So you elect somebody, some, some person, could be a man, could be a woman, that's going to run the village, okay? And that is the society that starts to develop. So in a nomadic society, everyone's kind of hunting, everyone's gathering, they're all sort of working communally together to, to make sure that they survive. But in a village setting, right, in the Neo Revolution, what you start to see is that people have roles. And it seems to me that it's human nature that because you have these different roles, some people have different responsibilities and they start to think their responsibilities are more important than others and you sort of start to create what we call a hierarchy where there's somebody on top and there's somebody on the bottom and there's all these gray levels in between. Okay? Um, you'll have a reading by Jared Diamond and he will talk all about that hierarchy and why this may be the worst thing that ever happened to humanity, but that is a discussion for another day. Okay, um, last things about the Neolithic Revolution. Obviously, you've got to have your homes and storing food. Um, you have to have structures where you can put all your corn into one central place uh, to store it, to keep it away from other animals that are trying to come in and take your food, right? Humans also, because it's sort of natural that if more humans, if everyone's got, uh, you know, some people have got corn, but other people have got steel arrowheads, that there would be a natural trading partners. And so we actually see a rise in trade. The concept that these different villages will trade with one another. I have cotton, you have um, arrowheads, and we're going to trade across. Okay, And it, it works. But there's also this other concept that if, if your harvest fails, there's a drought, let's say, or there's a flood, which happened a lot more than you'd think, if you have your fields too close to the water, what do you do then? Well, you could ask for help, but what if they say no? Okay. Some people will start to say, okay, you've got these farming villages. If my crop fails, I'm hungry. I need to feed my family. I'll go take from another rival village. And so some scholarships will, scholars will say that there is a uh, propensity for war, that people might fight one another a little bit more. Uh, something to think about. Uh, we've talked about the different roles between males and females. Females typically working in fields. Men um, have the security uh, role. They also have some hunting role because it's not like people just stop eating meat altogether. We don't all become vegetarians. So men would take on that hunting role while the women stayed to farm. Um, that's a general statement, of course. It's different in every civilization. 
we've talked about the social hierarchy. Um, I want to pull your attention to priests, priests being uh, pretty high on the ladder. This is a general pyramid. It's not how every society works, but this is to give you a framework. Priests, I'm talking about religious people. I'm talking about a lot of these polytheistic people. These people worship many, many gods going forward. Okay. Um, there are two ways to look at this revolution. Two very distinct ways. So one way is to look at it from a more of an idealist perspective. That is that the Neolithic Revolution is able to produce civilization. A positive switch in the human uh, brain, the human ideology. The idea that you will now have time for art. You will have time for music. You will have time uh, eventually for literature. You will have time to develop your own thoughts and your own thinking because you're not just chasing a herd, right? People are able to specialize and because they specialize, this is a good thing you bring about civilization. We're not doing cave paintings just anymore. There's more to this now, okay? That's one way of looking at the Neolithic Revolution. It's a pretty good thing. It ushers in civilization as we know it, okay? And this is an important concept for you to understand. What is a civilization? It's complex. They have a government structure to organize. They have a city. They have religion. They have social structure, that hierarchy, that pyramid. There's some writing. There's some art, right? A civilization is not just this constant search for food. It's beyond that now. You're starting to get complicated. You're starting to get more layers to people. Okay? That's an idealist interpretation. Now, Jared Diamond, on the other hand, is all going to argue that this is not good for people. A materialist would say that farming is going to produce inequality because somebody has to leave the village. Farming is going to produce malnutrition because we're relying on uh, food that doesn't produce uh, high, high calories like your, your nuts that you would do for hunting and gathering and the quality proteins that you would get. Um, now you're, you're eating corn, you're eating lettuce, you're, you're eating things that may not have the same caloric intake. And he even argues that uh, people were, were shorter after the Neolithic Revolution, and he looks into that. And I, I encourage you to, to read the, the article. And lastly, warfare. And we've talked about this. If my crop fails, I need to take yours, right? I need to feed my family. I need to feed myself, right? Hunger creates uh, this beast within humans. And then, you know, if you've ever seen a commercial, uh, you're hungry, you're out of Snickers. It's that concept just on an extreme level, okay? And I'll ask you to think about a negative effect of farming, an invisible one. The one I was looking for is when all these people get together, and everyone's getting together, and they really don't understand sanitation. They don't understand cleanliness, right? You see this invisible killer. We're, we're talking about disease. Disease is able to quickly spread in a village as opposed to a hunter-gatherer community that's always constantly moving, right? If everybody stays together and, and you're drinking from the same water, right, what do you think is going to happen? Eventually, disease is not just going to affect one person, but it can travel from person to person to person. Okay. So these are things to think about when you think of the Neolithic Revolution. There's two ways to look at it, two distinct lenses. Okay. All right. So we got four River Valley civilizations to, to talk about. I'll try to get it done in under a half hour. So here we go. We're going to start with the Fertile Crescent. Okay. And the Fertile Crescent is this land between two rivers, the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And I want you to know that the tiger is always on top, right? The tiger is the river that's to the north. The tiger is on top. The Euphrates is on the bottom. It'll help you for your map quiz. And the land in general is called Mesopotamia, okay? And so this land between the two rivers is a great land for the people because they have this water available to them to increase their crops and therefore uh, become a part of that Neolithic Revolution. Now, there wasn't regular flooding, like we'll talk about with other civilizations. You couldn't reliably know when it was going to flood. So what the people of Mesopotamia did, which was brilliant, is they used ditches to control the water. We call that irrigation. They would build ditches uh, so that they could take water from the main current and bring it somewhere else where they could manage it. 
so you didn't have your fields right next to the river because you didn't know when they were going to flood or not what you would do is you would take your fields a little further away and then you would make a ditch that connected the big body of water the river to the smaller fields where you were growing your crops in this picture i know it's not perfect but it sort of illustrates the idea of these little ditches being created so that people uh, could increase their their farmland but also use the water around them, right okay now um, the first civilization that we need to understand is the people of Sumer, not Summer, okay? Sumer. And the Sumerians built city-states. And it's important for you to understand what a city-state is. It's not just um, the city. It's the land surrounding that central city, okay? A city-state is big, in other words. So if we were going to talk about a city-state, um, in modern day, you know, around us, right? If we had a city-state of Lawrence, it wouldn't just be Lawrence, the city. It would be the surrounding areas of Milford. It would be the surrounding areas of Morris and Edmiston and Oneana, right? You'd have all of that sort of wrapped together. So it would be a much bigger place for you to control. And the Sumerians had a city-state called Ur. And Ur was a big city surrounded by these giant walls to protect themselves. And then all the land around it was the farming land. And so you had your farmers, and they made uh, use of the Euphrates River, built the old canals. It was a, a really amazing structure, and it worked for them. Um, it was a big place to rule, however. Uh, the people use mud bricks to build arches, uh, domes even, and this is long before the Romans. Like long, long, long. Like we won't even talk about the Romans until uh, you know, January. I mean, just a long, long time before we even get to these you know, complicated um, art, art, architecture of the Romans. And so, my point here is this. These people may not have had the most fanciest arches the most fanciest domes right may not have been you know most beautiful thing you've ever seen but the fact that they had it is almost a, it's just amazing to me um and this beautiful beautiful city that they started to create we actually see one of the the wonders of the world and i'll i'll, I'll talk about that a little bit um so what do you need to know about summer first they're polytheistic uh, they have a, a theocracy uh, for their government. So when you talk about polytheistic, you're talking about many gods. Now, you know, it, historians and archaeologists, they go back and forth on how many gods there are, but maybe 3,000. You know, that's a lot, right? They have a god for everything. God for the harvest, god for the moon, god for the sun, you know, god for everything that you can think of, god for the water, you know. And so all of these gods have different... Um, uh, things around them that they believe in and, and, and different ways to appease them. And so I'm not trying to, to complicate this too much, but I, I want you to know the difference between polytheistic people, where they worship many gods, and then the opposite of that would be a monotheistic people, which is maybe what you're more, uh, what you know more about, uh, that is like the Christian faith, right? Or the Islamic faith, Allah, okay? Where there is one God, uh, a little bit more central. These people do not believe in one God. It was polytheistic for sure. They deferred, they gave power to religious officials, priests, and those priests often ruled. Um, sometimes you have priest kings, right? Priests who, um, kings who, who were very, very, very much religious, um, but rule the kingdom. And so that's how uh, their society was structured. And then they built these huge things called ziggurats, these beautiful, beautiful buildings, these step pyramids so they're not uh, not as neat and tidy when you when you think about um, their structure as like an Egyptian pyramid they have little steps carved into them and um, it's sort of like the step way up to the heavens if you if you sort of think about it that way and this is like a computer artistic rendition of, of what they perhaps look like um, the concept is that they have these steps these different levels they're really really all inspiring okay uh, different things uh, to know, they use bronze, okay? Bronze is a better metal um, and better than iron. It's stronger, it's tougher. And what they would do is they would go to the, the Mediterranean, which is really their eastern neighbor, and they would trade. And they trade for wool, trade for different foods. And this back and forth 
helped the Sumerians grow, grow stronger. And again, this is an example of the Neolithic Revolution. You know, I have bronze, um, you have wool, let's make the trade. The Sumerians also, because of the Neolithic Revolution, they're allowed to specialize. You have what we call artisans, right? You have people who specialize. And some people specialize enough that they created something called the wheel, which made things so much easier to transport, okay? And another really cool idea that they had uh, was this number system based on 60. Why does that sound familiar? You must ask. Take a look. If you have a watch or a clock, it's numbered to 60, right? It's not an accident. It didn't just happen that way. Okay. The Sumerians create that foundation and then we improve on it. Same thing with the wheel. They create this early wheel. Not perfect. It's a Fred Flintstone style wheel, right? Um, but we have since you know, improved upon that invention. But this is the start. And that's the thing that I want you to understand. They have a uh, language system based around uh, what we call cuneiform. Um, I don't really care how you pronounce it. I know that's a terrible thing to say. I don't think anyone really knows for sure how to pronounce it. There's a, there's a lot of different pronunciations that I see. Uh, cuneiform works for me. And you have this social hierarchy where you've got your nobles, you've got your commoners, you've got your slaves. But the, the, the concept here is, is that they're keeping records. They're eventually going to create a law system that is written down that all people must follow. And this is a huge step for humanity. Um, in that you've got people writing and this is this allows us to understand their society this allows us to look back and say they created this this and this they even have these uh these epics these these really impressive poems in which they talk about um the rise and fall of this uh this king named gilgamesh who tries to search for immortality because he, he he really doesn't want to die like his friend and and he's he ultimately realizes that immortality is something he cannot achieve. He cannot be like the gods. And I, and I think that there's a, a tale, there's a moral to learn from a story like this. And the point here is that they want, they're writing these things down because they want their generations to, to, to love their culture and their civilization and understand the core values to respect the gods. Right? Um, okay, last but not least in Mesopotamia, some rulers to know. And this is where we get into the law code stuff. So King Hammurabi, maybe the most important thing you need to know, is Hammurabi creates a law code. And the region's basic understanding of Hammurabi's code is an eye for an eye. That is, uh, you know, if someone were to, uh, you know, destroy, um, you know, cut someone's finger off, your finger's gone off, right? The idea is that whatever happens to you, uh, you can do to the other person. It is very basic, okay? I want you to know that I've read the law code. It is not that simple. That's maybe the core for a commoner, okay? But the difference here is, and something I want you to capture, is that it's really not an eye for an eye because nobles got punished less severely than a common peasant. Very clear in the law code. So there was bias. If you're a noble or you're a priest, you're, you're not going to have the eye for an eye. You're going to have to pay some fine if you uh, perhaps got into a fight with a commoner and ended up killing them. There's a little fine you got to pay. It's, it's very, very uh, biased towards the wealthy. It's biased towards the people that support the king. Okay. Now, that being said, because it's a biased code, it's not a good code, right? Other historians say, yes, we respect that there is... Uh, you know, this terrible bias and an eye for an eye is a very brutish way to do things. It is. But some historians say, well, that's the foundation. We need to start somewhere. Okay. Now, someone like me might argue the opposite and say, no, you don't start from a bad place where there's social, you know, uh, differences between the two. If you start at a bad place, how are you ever going to get to a great place? Did, is our law code messed up even today because we started from such a poor place and we never got any better? Okay, it was, it was always flawed from the beginning and we were never really able to fix it. So there's two ways of looking at this. Is it some great place to start from where you finally get some laws? It's better than anarchy and, and total you know, people running around uh, like crazy men? Or is this something where we started bad and we're still struggling to fix it to this day because we started so bad?
And next we've got the Empire of Sargon. And Sargon's rule is interesting to me because he started from nowhere. He was an orphan taken in uh, by a family and he didn't know um, who his parents were, his father, his mother. He had actually been uh, tossed down the river uh, in a basket. Reminds you of the story of Moses. And I think there was a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. He wanted to uh, prove to his parents that he could be something. And as Sargon uh, grew up, he decided that you know, he was really good as a soldier, uh, eventually as a military commander. And he slowly, over time, built what we call the world's first empire. But the more important thing is, is to me at least, is, is not that he created an empire necessarily, but that he was able to rule this empire and create a blueprint by which others could start to rule an empire. So first, what is an empire? It is lands, many lands, that is ruled by one central leader, in this case, Sargon. Okay, and Sargon ruled all of Mesopotamia. And the way that he did it was through a really good tax system where he would take over an area and demand that, that that area pay him a certain amount of taxes to keep his empire going, to pay his soldiers, right? And, of course, when you're building an empire, not everyone wants to be taken over, okay? There's some bad blood that you build as you, as you make that empire. And so he created a road system. And that road system not only unifies his empire and allows him to put down rebellions quicker, but it allows him to, to take in that tax system and take in that, that tribute um, more efficiently. The Persians will do this. The Romans will do this. Uh, any empire that we study that stays around for a long time has a strong road system and good tax system. Okay, So that's sort of the underpinnings of what a great empire is. Last but not least, we have a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, say that five times fast. And Nebuchadnezzar builds upon what Sargon has and creates the city-state known as Babylon. And if you've ever heard of Babylon, you've probably heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It's one of the seven wonders of the world pictured over there. Okay, um, Since destroyed, and so we don't really have a good picture of what, what that is. We only have uh, what writings say about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So the, the story goes and Nebuchadnezzar had this built to make his wife feel at home while she was in Babylon because she had not come from Babylon. She had come from a rival city-state. So Nebuchadnezzar builds this wonderful palace for her to feel at home and feel welcomed and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, last but not least, he also built this famous, famous temple of Babel. And the Old Testament, which we'll talk about some other day, uh, describes, it's like the early Bible, right, describes that the temple uh, was destroyed by God. And it was destroyed by God because it was built so high and so grand and so wonderful that the people, the workers, um, you know, started to say, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is this is what mankind can do. And so, to, you know, start to think of mankind maybe as something uh, very powerful, something maybe on the level of the gods and uh, with all of this arrogance, uh, God comes down and not only destroys the Temple of Babel, right, but he also punishes all of the workers who thought that their wonderful construction, this thing that could rival God himself, right, um, this beautiful, beautiful building, they said, he said the punishment would be that all of these different workers would speak a different language, and therefore, that is why we have all of these different languages, why one person may speak Arabic as opposed to English, as opposed to Spanish, right, is because of this old story of the Temple of Babel, okay? Uh, something to know about um, as we move forward. Pretty cool little story. All right, so with Mesopotamia out of the way, I want to talk about the Egyptians, and I'm going to go through it pretty quick because I think there's a good layer that you already know about. And to know about the Egyptians, you got to know about the Nile. It's the longest river in the world, flows north because of elevation. Okay, understanding that uh, very few rivers flow north, um, a lot of them flow south, but it's because of elevation. Okay, it's, it's higher uh, in the south than it is in the north. And so it flows down. The yearly flooding of the Nile, this is why it's 
I don't want to say better, but sort of uh, makes life a little bit easier for the Egyptians because the Nile River floods fairly regularly. So you can count on it flooding on a particular month. And because of that, you know that you can um, expect the flooding to come, and that's good for you to put down your crop, but it's also good to make sure that you get rid of your crop and, and make sure that you harvest your crop before it floods. Does that make sense? I hope it does. You don't want the Nile to flood and take away your crop and, you know, it goes down the river, right? All that work for nothing. It's also really good for the Egyptians because they can transport not only for trade, um, to trade later with like Nubians, but also to, to eventually conquer those same, same people in the south called the Nubians. Um, and so it's, it's a militarily advantageous for you uh, to have the river. So that's a very materialist argument, right? Now, Egyptian history has got three basic divisions. And I like this map over here. It gives you an idea of, of where we're talking about. So three kingdoms to know about. The first would be the old, the, the second, the middle, and lastly, the new kingdom. So if you're going to study this on your own or you're going to take a college course on, on Egyptian history, this is like how they're going to frame their course. They're probably going to teach it through these three different time periods. I'm just going to give you snapshots um, just to help you get a basic idea of Egypt. So in the Old Kingdom, we're going to talk about the basics, the pharaoh, right? A pharaoh is considered to be half god, half man. And at this time, the pharaoh really is supposed to be better than all of the people. He's not really supposed to associate with people too much. The people exist to serve the pharaoh because ultimately, the pharaoh is related to God, okay, or to the God. Uh, for example, Pharaoh Khufu, he's got this beautiful, wondrous uh, temple uh, called the Pyramid of Giza, and it's built to be his tomb, right? So all of these people, you know, thousands of people working to create one man's tomb, and that's just incredible. But but how does that work? Well, well, they, they worship the Pharaoh, and they believe that to make the Pharaoh happy is to make the gods happy, and to make the gods happy is to get a good harvest, and therefore uh, to eat and um, take care of their families. It's all kind of this big cycle. The Old Kingdom also has this wondrous uh, creation, um, the Great Sphinx. And it was used to guard the Emperor. They believed that the Sphinx would guard the Emperor in the afterlife. And of course, part of their, their ritual for, for death is mummification. I know you know what that is, but basically just to preserve their dead. Okay, so the basics of the Old Kingdom, you've got a pharaoh. That pharaoh tells people what to do, when to do, and how to do it. In the Middle Kingdom, this middle time period here, things are a little bit different. The pharaohs aren't necessarily concerned with, you know, total control over the people. In fact, they're going to become what we call a shepherd of the people, right? Guide the people. Uh, teach them, you know, what is good about Egyptian society and, and, and kind of be like, the, I don't want to say big brother, kind of like a father to the people, I guess. And for many people, this is the best time period to study in Egypt because you get, like, their golden age. You get civilization at its height. You know, math, science, architecture is going to really be a huge for them. And the Egyptians are going to conquer the people of the south called Nubia. And by conquering them, uh, they expand their territory. They expand their wealth as a result. They start to trade in the Middle East. They start to trade with this little island called Crete in the Mediterranean Sea and um, the Middle Kingdom, particularly the Golden Age. And then last but not least, the new kingdom of Egypt, as they sort of fan out and begin conquering more land, they're doing it under this female pharaoh called Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut. And she is going to focus on trade. So after they, they, they spread out and they conquer, they, they take all of this trade and Egypt is going to grow wealthy. But the end of the story is not necessarily um, the greatest, as Egypt is going to fall to a man named Alexander the Great, but that is many, many, many um, uh, hundreds and thousands of years later, so um, I'm planting that seed now to let you recognize the name when we do talk about Alexander. Uh, but the Egyptians, you've got their core society, their core values. Um, I want to show you a little bit about them. So first, if you're talking about a writing system, you should know it's hieroglyphics. Okay, that's what that, um, that image is over to the left. And they use papyrus, which is more to the right, or the center, um, as, a, as a paper so that they can write down and record information. They have a 365-day calendar. Why does that sound familiar? Okay, um, their art is called frontalism. That is why you can see the 
full body um, of people as they're going through. It's a specific Egyptian style. They were, of course, polytheistic, and I'm sure you can riddle off a couple of names, you know, Cyrus, Ra, um, many, many, many more. The one I want you to know is, of course, Ra, the god of the sun, maybe the most important one there. You've got a, a in this particular um, frontalism uh, painting, you've got a, what looks to be Anubis in the center. So, an interesting thing that I want you to keep in the back of your mind is that girls are married at age of 12, boys at 14. So, very, very young. Like, really, to just I mean, give your, your life up uh, at that point, become a, um, a wife. It's pretty crazy, 12 years old. I'm going to leave this review riddle up here. You can pause the video and take a take a shot at these two riddles. They're good ones. Um, try them out. See if you can answer them. Good little checkpoint for you. And I've got 10 questions here. This would be a good time for you to pause, relax for a second. You've been listening to me for far too long, I'm sure. Um, 10 questions and even a bonus question for you uh, to try to answer. If you can answer these questions, um, I think you're in good shape, okay? All right, we've got the Indus River Valley and then we've got China and we're done, guys. So the Indus River Valley is a mysterious civilization uh, that rises up along the subcontinent of India. India is so big, we call it a subcontinent because it's got this huge mass of land. And there's a good map to show you that you've got the Himalayan mountains to the north and the Hindu Kush, um, you've got this huge, huge mountains going up to the north. And what that's going to do is create that natural barrier, materialist concept, right? The idea that the, these mountains are great for defense, they keep India insulated from everyone else, and as a result, they're able to um, not have to worry about warfare so much as they can focus on building up their civilization along another place called the Indus River. Now, the Ganges and the Indus rivers are unique because they rely on what are called monsoons. And monsoons is this incredibly heavy rainfall that descends down upon um, India. It still does to this day. And it's not like, you know, a little rain. It's like, it's like rain that's like raining sideways, like rain that's going to flood your place out, okay? And you have to cope with these monsoons, and that's why irrigation is so important, because you're going to get this mass of water very, very quickly over the course of a month, and you need to be able to channel those monsoons, channel that rain um, to make sure you can use it for farming. Two cities that develop along the Indus River, the first would be Mahanjadaro, the second Harappa. And the two cities are organized in what we call a grid pattern. And a grid pattern should sound familiar because that's like New York City. New York City is a grid pattern. It makes for uh, streets that are easy to navigate very quickly. Okay, We still use a grid pattern uh, to organize our cities. And so I bring it up because these people are complex. These people are thinkers, right? Um, and we'll see that they create these three-story buildings. Three-story buildings. It's incredible. And in addition to that, they face the buildings in such a way that the current from the Himalayan mountains, this cool mountain air, comes down and goes right through their buildings. And so it's like air conditioning for them. So these people got three-story buildings, air conditioning, got a modern grid pattern. They are so far and away ahead of of what later Europeans will be doing during the Middle Ages. It's incredible. Uh, they even have uh, drainage systems for bathrooms. They have sewage drains to get waste out of the cities. The drains run underneath the city and then um, evacuate out of the city so that you can get all the nastiness out of your, your, your place. So that's going to reduce disease, right? Now, there are people in... Um, New York City during, you know, age of immigration, you know, 1850s in America that did not have access to uh, sewage drains like this, okay? 1850s, okay? So the level of ingenuity is just, it's just amazing to me. Uh, the people even had sheets to, like, carry trash out to, like, little trash bins, right? It just sounds so modern. Um, 
they are trading with the Sumerians. They're going to gain wolves. I'm sure they're gaining some bronze, but but, but definitely um, definitely wolves. And Indus, and this is unique, peaceful people. Very, very, very peaceful. We don't see a lot of the, the swords, arrowheads, armor, plating. We don't see a lot of that. Um, we see these animal seals where... Uh, they have different animals on them, particularly the cows. And so some historians say, wow, that's sort of the bedrock for Indian culture because Indians today, you know, Hindus, um, uh, believe that the cow is sacred, right? And so you've got this sort of uh, bedrock of Indian culture from the Indus people. Uh, they create this big structure called the Great Bath where everyone comes together and they can take a bath at once. Yeah, I know, that sounds really gross, right? Um, but it's supposed to have some religious significance. Of course, we don't know um, what this purpose was for. We're guessing its religious significance, and we're guessing it because we don't know what happened to these people. We can't decipher their language. And because we cannot decipher their language, because there's no Rosetta Stone, that is the idea that the Indus River Valley people have have a language, and then below it is maybe the Mesopotamian language, and then below that is maybe the Roman language. We don't have any of that. We don't have a conversion. And so because we don't have a conversion, there's really no way for us to figure out this language. Okay. Therefore, I can't tell you what happened to them. We can only tell you what archaeologists think may have happened to them. And we think that either A, it could have been an earthquake that sort of weakened their structures. It could have been some kind of drought uh, where they didn't have enough of the rainfall. The monsoons never really came. And as a result, the people had to, had to leave. Some say they just used their resources out, and as a result, they overused their land, overused their resources. Population kept growing so big because of the, the amount of food they were able to produce. And as a result, uh, it created this awful, awful uh, system. We call it a Malthusian crisis, where basically the population runs out of food. The major interpretation, however, is that a warrior group of nomads called the Aryans invaded through and destroyed the Indian people, okay? Um, and remember that that interpretation makes sense given the fact that the Indus people were not warriors themselves. And so some people say the Aryans crashed through, um, destroyed their civilization, and um, kept on moving because that's what warrior nomads use. Uh, they had chariots, so they were totally outclassed, right? Now, after the Indus people failed, for whatever reason that was, maybe a combination, the nomadic Aryans eventually settle in northern India. They're going to use some of the iron technology discovered by people called the Hittites of the Middle East. We'll talk about them later. Uh, and they create something called the iron plow. So they eventually do become farmers. They're able to plow their land. They use this, this writing system called Sanskrit, um, which is something that Hindus... Uh, we'll use to create the holy text known as the Vedas. Again, I'm just planting the seeds, guys. We're going to talk about Sanskrit. We're going to talk about the Vedas, and you're going to know Hinduism really, really well in my class. Um, but for now, I just want you to sort of start to trace the concept, where these people are starting and where these people are going to end up. Okay? Um, the Aryan culture, the male-dominated society, we call it paternalism, or paternalistic. That is, that men drive the society, they are supposed to be the leaders. Women in, in an Aryan society were supposed to be submissive, they weren't supposed to be educated, um, couldn't divorce, couldn't choose their husband, so there's some roots there of a society that is very, very unequal. And I'll plant this seed as well. There is a ritual that develops in the Aryan culture called Sati. Sati is a... scary to me. Um, women were expected to perform uh, what we call ritual suicide. When their when their husband dies, they're supposed to throw themselves on the funeral pyre, this you know, massive structure of wood that's, that's lit on fire. They're supposed to basically throw themselves into the fire. Um, and if they did not, then they were expect they were disloyal. They were cast out of society. They were looked down upon because they didn't kill themselves after their husband died. Uh, Sati is something that will later be fought and outlawed, but we've got a long thousands of years before we even get there. So for thousands of years, this is a practice that is embedded into uh, what we will later call Indian culture. Okay, but at this time, every culture. Okay, 
So that's the Indus. Um, John Green does a great video on the Indus if you want a little bit more. Um, you've got some review riddles just to check your, your knowledge here and, and, and try to remember. Okay. Um, now, last civilization. i got to be done soon. So here I go. I'm going to jump into geography of China. And I want you to know that China is such a diverse geographic area. It's really hard for me to talk about geography because it's got everything. It's got rainforests. It's got mountains. It's got rivers. It's got valleys. It's got everything. Okay. So we'll just spotlight a couple things. Uh, the first river is the Huangi River. And it's also known as the Yellow River. And the reason for that, you can see in the bottom left corner, uh, it's because the river is yellow because of the silt. Yeah, that's it. So you got the Huangi River, um, Yellow River. It's also known as the River of Sorrows. Not as easy to understand. That's because the river does not flood like the Nile River. Very predictable. You always know when it's coming. In fact, it floods so bad that it just destroys the land around it, and it can flood really, really bad. So you think that your fields are far enough away, and then boom, these floods come through and destroy all your crop, and man, now you've got to start stealing from other people, right? Maybe. Okay. The other river to know is the Yangtze River. Uh, it's the longest river in China. It's in the south. So why are we talking about southern China? Like, we'll talk about the Sung Dynasty. We're talking more about the Yangtze River. So... Let's get you an idea. Uh, the Himalayan Mountains, another, well, they're great for India. They also uh, provide this natural barrier uh, for the, uh, the the Chinese people. So the Aryan people had come through and found, found a way around the Himalayan Mountains. And I guess perhaps they could have done that too for China, but they didn't, okay? Um, because China's got the Himalayan Mountains. But then if you pass through the Himalayan Mountains and you get, uh, you know, northern up into China, you run into the Gobi Desert. So it's not like, uh, you know, all this work to get through the mountains to now get into the heat of the Gobi Desert. So they're really insulated from, from other cultures. And as a result, China starts to believe that they really are like the only culture in the world. Uh, I'll talk about it later, but they call themselves the Middle Kingdom because nobody comes to them. So they're, they're so insulated from, from the rest of the world, they think that they're the only people in the world. Um, and they'll find out much later that they're not. But for now, that's what they believe. They decide to eventually unify around what we call an emperor. Uh, and the emperor's name was Shang, and Emperor Shang creates the Shang Dynasty. So we'll keep it simple. They've got this capital city called Anyang. And Anyang is a, um, is a city where the emperor can be housed. And the emperor relies on what we call warlords, people who are good at fighting, okay? Uh, and these warlords have local rule, and then they report to the emperor. The emperor is ultimately the one that's chosen by God to rule, and we call that the mandate of heaven. Basically, the concept is, is that the emperor has the mandate. The emperor has control um, from God. And as a result, the emperor... Um, should be loved. The emperor should be revered. The people should worship the emperor, right? So that's the basic concept. I'll show you how uh, one emperor and one dynasty may fall um, as we go through. Uh, a little bit about the Shang. They have um, a interesting system where servants are actually the most faithful, right? The servants are buried with the emperor. Now, that doesn't mean that the servants are buried dead all the time either, which is really awful if you think about it, okay? Uh, we'll talk about that with the chin later. Uh, the Shang will use oracle bones to tell the future. So they have bones of creatures, and they'll write on the bones and use the bones as a, as a method for telling the future. And so people are very, um, I don't want to say superstitious, but certainly believe in this kind of um, uh, future, future telling. Their writing is a system of pictographs, so picturegrams, kind of. Um, and they use what is called calligraphy, that beautiful writing um, system to try to um, organize records, tell stories, things like that. There's also this idea of yin and yang within Shang culture. So not only do they worship their ancestors and, and, and really revere their ancestors, but there's also this idea that in life, you should strive for balance. So you should try to find somewhere in the middle. Um, so yin is more of this negative outlook, whereas yang is more positive in that you have to be somewhere in the middle for your life to be um, uh, you know, the right way to walk, the right way to be. And 
to sort of fulfill this you know central idea right you have china as the middle kingdom so china believed that they were the only people in the world and as a result they were obviously the best culture in the world because you know they're the only ones around okay and we call it this ethnocentrism or what i'd like to call with my students americanism right because americans think you know we have the best culture and all that kind of stuff right so this is a little bit of americanism right or ethnocentrism you're the best culture you're the one that matters okay all right um, so how do you know, dynasties go from one to another? Well, what happens is we call it a dynastic cycle. Basically, on a you know, general idea, in order for a dynasty to fall, they believe, the Chinese people do, that uh, there must be a sign from God that the emperor is doing something wrong. Either the emperor is being immoral, that is, he is not uh, following yin and yang, the emperor is you know, doing some evil things. Uh, for example, the emperor Shang, there were rumors that he was like, uh, you know, eating his own people, um, that he was like a cannibal. Uh, I don't know that that was a really true, true uh, rumor. I think that was a rumor to, to create um, uh, anger towards the emperor. But my point here is that if the emperor, uh, if there are rumors about the emperor being immoral or there's some sort of natural disaster, that is a sign from, from God himself saying that the emperor needs to be uh, kicked out and that there needs to be a new dynasty. Okay? So typically the way it works is the old dynasty, it's all these great things, you know, road building, taxes, able to really create this beautiful, beautiful civilization, and then some bad things start to happen. And then you get this new dynasty that comes in, and it is a cycle. We'll talk about the different cycles as they move through. Um, but for one dynasty to change hands, for one dynasty to go you know, from, from the Shang dynasty to the Qin dynasty, what has to happen is there needs to be some belief that the old dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven, that God has made it so that they are unfavorable. And usually that's by a natural disaster, but sometimes it can be by uh, rumors of an immoral person uh, in, in charge. And from my perspective, uh, I like to argue with my students that, that the warlord idea, that concept of spreading out rule um, for China is not very good because China is such a big, big place that if you don't have control over those warlords, they start to think, why do I need an emperor? I can just rule. Okay, so there's some uh, human greed that gets in the way of this, and of course that's a very idealist uh, interpretation. Uh, the next dynasty to come after the Shang is called the Zhao dynasty. Um, and the Zhao were able to take over, not necessarily by a natural disaster, but because they, they call the old Shang emperor immoral. They said he used to swim in ponds of wine, that he was very cruel, and like I said, that he was like, you know, a cannibal. So because of that, uh, the Zhao said, we don't want to be ruled by a cannibal. We don't want to be ruled by guys, you know, total alcoholic, right? Spread all these rumors, and the Zhao are able to claim that the mandate of heaven was taken away, and that they should have the mandate, and so they take over. And they create this concept, this idea called feudalism. And the basics of feudalism is that you exchange land for protection. So I give the peasants land, right? and tell them you're going to take this land i'm going to protect you on the land right but in exchange for that i want you to give me a little kickback of food um, and that's how it works you give a little plot of land you expect that the peasants are going to work that land and you'll provide the protection okay in this case the warlords are providing the protection for the peasants it's a system that will occur in europe if it's not quite clear it will be clear when we talk about europe i just want you to know that this is the basic idea uh, one of the most important crops is, of course, silk. Silk is a national secret for the Chinese people. They do not want other nations or other cultures to know about silk. Now, that's not a problem during the Zhao because they believe that they're the only people in the world. But as dynasties go further and further, and when they start to run into people like Marco Polo, they're going to try to keep this trade secret uh, from spreading for a while. They don't want people to know how to make it. And they'll sell it to you. But they don't want you to know how silk is made. And of course, we know now it's through silkworms. But at the time, it was top secret so that they could uh, have a monopoly on silk. And it was a brilliant, brilliant economic strategy, at least. Um, the fall of the Zhao sounds a lot like the fall of Shang in that they rely on that warlord system. 
And I think that that system is a failed system. China will try it a couple of times and they will watch it crash and burn. Whenever you spread out different rulers like that, uh, it's just sort of becomes this natural concept that the warlords are going to want more and more and more from the emperor. They don't like sharing. And it will lead to a period called the warlord states. Um, you can pretty much expect what the warlord states period is going to be. It's going to be a bunch of warlords battling over the land. Uh, and it will take a cruel emperor uh, by the name of Shi Huang Di uh, to unify China under a brutal, brutal law system called legalism. But that is a story for another day, folks. So uh, thanks for watching. Check out this uh, you know, wonderful cartoon on your way out. Um, and again, I hope this video helps you guys. This is Mr. Casey, um, Ancient River Valley Civilizations and the Neolithic Revolution. Have a great day.